I'm proud to welcome you to the fall 2022 lecture series here at Dominican. My name is Dr. Leanne Bartolini. I'm a professor of psychology here at Dominican and a member of Dominican's Institute for Leadership Studies board. This leadership lecture series is a program of Dominican's Institute for Leadership Studies, a leadership development center offering education and training, guiding students and professionals to become better leaders and team members. The leadership lecture series is a partnership with Book Passage, the San Francisco Bay Area's prized independent bookstore, to engage students, the campus, and the community in socially relevant discussions. For 18 years, we've highlighted inspired acts of leadership across the disciplines with 148 world-class authors and change leaders. Book Passage is much more than a bookstore. If you've been there, you know it's a community center, a community treasure. And we thank Elaine and Bill Petrocelli and the Book Passage team for their vision and commitment to education and community building. Karen West, who you just met, Book Passage Events Director, will join us tonight at the culmination of the event for some questions and answers and closing remarks. As silver sponsor of tonight's event, Dominican University of California's Woman Leadership and Philanthropy Council, a giving circle that inspires women to lead, collaborate, and contribute, is excited to support tonight's program. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. Our distinguished speaker tonight that you just heard about, Dr. Temple Grandin, is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and the author of New York Times bestsellers, Animals in Translation, Animals Make Us Human, The Autistic Brain, and Thinking in Pictures, which became an HBO movie starring Claire Danes. Dr. Grandin has been a pioneer in improving the welfare of farm animals, as well as an outspoken advocate for the autism community. Tonight, Dr. Grandin will discuss her new book, Visual Thinking. Please join me with a warm welcome for Dr. Temple Grandin. Great to be here. Got lots of things to talk about. Professor, I'm a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. And uh, I had no speech until I was uh, four years old. And I, I want to emphasize the importance of good teachers. I had some great teachers, starting with an elementary school, my science teacher, my mother, always pushing me to do things. I want to see the kids that are different <coughs> get out there and be successful. Now, I think completely in pictures, and I didn't realize that most other people thought verbally until I was in my late 30s. And the way I found that out was I asked a speech therapist one day to think about a church steeple, how does it come into her mind? And I was shocked that she just got a pointy thing like this. I see very specific ones because I'm a bottom-up thinker. Pictures just come to me like a series of, of course, back then, 35-millimeter slides. <laughs> Got to date myself. <coughs> now it's PowerPoint slides. But it was shocking to find out that other people didn't think the way I do. Now, a lot of the things in this book is aimed at businesses, that these kids that are different, they need to hire us because you need our skills. I'm gonna be showing how we're losing skills. And at the reception, I talked to one therapist that said that educators were afraid to let autistic kids use tools. Well, I'll tell you right now, a lot of autistic people built my cattle handling facilities. You see, this is one of the things, findings that go back and forth <coughs> between the education world 
in the industrial world. There's this huge gap. Nobody knows what's going on in the other places. Now, being a visual thinker helped me in my animal work because I looked at what cattle were looking at. People thought that was kind of weird. Things like a shadow in a chute would make the animals refuse to move. Well, it was obvious to me, you'd think in pictures, to look at what animals are looking at. You see, an animal is a sensory-based thinker, not a word-based thinker. An animal lives in a world of sight, sounds. It's sensory-based. <laughs> now, five years ago, I got a chance to visit NASA down at Cape Kennedy, visit this launch pad. And right now, there's a rocket on it that they're having some problems with. And you, NASA needs people like me that are terrible in higher math because I found something in the launch pad that shouldn't be there. I saw a little motion. This is five years ago I saw this. A little motion up on the steps, and a raccoon came out of it. <laughs> and then I got inside the base, and I saw fueling equipment. I don't really want this guy around. Now, whether he had anything to do with some of the problems now, I don't know. I hope they got rid of him. But nobody else noticed that there was a raccoon there. See, I'm a visual thinker who can't do higher math. But I want to show the engineering world that you need us visual thinkers that can't do higher math. Because we're the clever engineers who do a lot of you know, mechanical things. And in my book, I have a chapter <coughs> in there on disasters. And I was horrified when I found out why Fukushima burned up. The engineers did a perfect job of calculating the earthquake shaking the reactor. Everything was fine. 20 minutes later, the tsunami drowned it. They didn't see water flooding the site. They didn't see that risk. It drowned the emergency cooling pump and its electric motor. Now, I can't design a nuclear reactor, but I know electric pumps don't run under water real well. That I do know. There's two parts of engineering. There's the more mathematical parts. And then there is the visual thinking parts of it. No, but we need the different kinds of minds. I'm doing a talk tomorrow by Zoom to a major pharmaceutical company. They need people like me to work on research to make sure the methods of experiments are done right. So what kind of thinker are you? Do you like the IKEA diagrams? <laughs> or do you read the verbal instructions? I'd rather just look at the pictures. And I tell businesses, well, you need to get these different kinds of minds. You need these people that think differently. You need them in your business. You actually need these skills. You like to look at maps or read directions sequentially? I would much prefer to look at maps. <coughs> That would make it a whole lot easier. But one of the things, I had a terrible time. I couldn't do algebra. And I'm very concerned that kids with my kind of mind getting screened out because of all the algebra requirements. I worked with people that owned big machine shops, designing and patenting complicated equipment, selling it around the world. They couldn't do algebra either. You see, there's the mathematical side of engineering, and then there's the visual thinking side and let me tell you, your power grid needs it, and you need it big time. Because a little 59-cent fastener from 1921 let the insulator drop off the uh, cross arm of those big towers, and that caused that fire. They hadn't replaced this stuff. I can't believe it. 45-mile-an-hour winds, and you got to turn the power off? Yeah, you need us that can't do math to fix the power grid. And I'm saying it absolutely seriously. We're the ones that get out there and we do stuff. But I'm seeing too many kids today growing up, they've never used tools. They're totally removed from the world of the practical. And they're going to be making policy. I just was in the, my green room, was an office of political science professor. I just read a book on the logic of anarchy. And it was written in all kinds of jargon I didn't understand. Um, I can't even remember some of the words. Very, very, very abstract. Well, we need people to get out and do things, like get solar panels on the more roofs 
I can't believe it. Texas is ahead of California on roof solar panels. I do my airplane final approach solar panel survey. <laughs> yep, I actually look out the window of airplanes. It's amazing what you can see if you just look. Now, you need, you need visual thinking and scientific research because how you do the methods of your experiment matters. Millions of dollars worth of cancer research were ruined because the labs didn't say which one of these mixing devices they used to stir up their cancer cell samples. It wrecked the research. It matters what you mix it with. So a lot of science right now, we're getting more and more and more math and more and more stuff like that, but they're leaving out that you use a magnetic stirrup <coughs> or did you use this little Ferris wheel contraption. It matters. It totally changes the results. And then I read a big fancy physics paper, I didn't understand the math, got retracted because they didn't say what type of carbon they used on a superconducting experiment. That's sort of like saying what kind of flour you didn't use to bake a cake. Yeah, these things matter. Three different ways of basic thinking. <coughs> I'm what's called an object visualizer. And there's a lot of research to show that there's object visualizers like me, and then more mathematical visual spatial thinkers. We're the ones who invent a lot of mechanical equipment. Absolutely can't do algebra. I'm getting screened out. Maybe Pacific Gas and Electric is going to change it to when well, they have a 35 mile an hour wind, they have to turn the power off. As more and more connectors have corroded on those towers. I see it. There's a connection here between what's going on with the electrical grid and what's going on in education. No, these kids need to be using tools. I was using tools in second grade. And I'm seeing too many parents that get so locked in the label, they can't imagine their kid can even do anything. But I worked with all kinds of people that were undiagnosed, autistic, dyslexic, and ADHD. Owning businesses. How about a corporate jet thrown in? You see, the skilled trades is the one area where you don't need a college degree. You need it for a lot of other things. High-end skilled trades. I'm not talking about asphalt here. But mechanics and art actually go together. Mechanics and art go together. Photography, <coughs> working with animals, those kind of things all go together. And then you have your visual spatial. These are your traditional STEM students computer programming, engineering, chemistry, physics, music, mathematics. It's a visual spatial mind. Well, and we're turning out lots and lots of visual spatial minds. But one of the things I, things I learned working on the book, that um, doctors are having a hard time teaching their students how to sew up cuts, because they never use scissors. They never used a needle and thread. I had a student in my class who had never used a ruler in her life to measure anything. That was last year. <coughs> That's really ridiculous. <laughs> really, really ridiculous. And then, of course, we got our verbal thinkers who think in words. Writers, teachers, sales, marketing, psychologists, lawyer, think in words. And there's been research that shows that different kinds of thinking exist. But the thing is, a lot of people are mixtures of the different kinds of thinking. A lot of people are mixtures. But you will not find an extreme <coughs> object visualizer like me and an extreme mathematician in the same person. It doesn't exist. One of the stops I did on this bookstore, book tour, <coughs> I'm sorry, I've got you know kind of throat problem right now. Uh, it's Harvard, and they have a maker space at Harvard. It's labeled physics lab, and they had crocheting in it. I'm not kidding, along with the 3D printers. And they've got to start getting these students back doing hands-on things. A lot of people are mixtures of the different kinds of thinking, but a lot of people haven't thought about how they think. And one of the mistakes that's made with kids that are math whizzes is forcing them to do the math sequentially, showing their work. That's not how they think. Let them just do it in their head. 
Turns out I got a big <coughs> visual thinking circuit in my head. Okay, what way do you like your information? Let's say I have to explain to you how a water pump works. My kind of mind will look at the pictures. The verbal thinker will look at the written text. The mathematician tends to look at both. But I'm always going to look at the pictures first. That's the thing that I'm going to look at. <coughs> this was a fascinating study. They had art students, science students who were more mathematical, and humanities students more verbal. Uh, their job was to design a planet. So the art students would make fantastic planets, crystal planet, skyscraper planet, stuff like that. The science students would make round planets, kind of plain, describe the atmosphere. The humanities students started writing it down, and they go, well, we weren't supposed to write, so they made splotches of color. But you know what was shocking? The verbal students didn't do any planning. Really shocking. Verbal thinkers tend to overgeneralize, very top down. This is where there's problems with getting locked into the labels. And then they don't think the kid is going to even do anything. They leave, leave out a lot of the details. Object visualizers like me and the mathematicians were bottom up. At one of the other talks, <coughs> I had a student ask me, what can we do for sustainability? Well, let's look at something much more targeted like preventing, reducing supermarket food waste, which is huge. And I was just talking uh, tonight to the nice person that brought me over here. I'm, I'm bad on remembering names. And she a, does a project where they take old furniture that people are going to throw out and give it to people that need it. OK, that is something targeted, something local. Maybe work on getting more solar panels put up. You know, that's something. <coughs> something local, it's not something theoretical. See, the verbal mind tends to be very theoretical. And I was looking at some of the political science books in there, total theory. I have to admit, I only understood about one-fourth of it. Very, very, very theoretical. How do you apply it? See, this is where you need my kind of thinker to say, OK, let's do something targeted to actually make a real change. Now, the early inventors were the visualizers like me, inventing mechanical equipment, things like grain harvesting equipment, the sewing machine. These were mechanical devices. And the patent office, when it first started, required inventors to make models of their equipment. Yeah, it was sort of like my kind of mind tinkering around in the shop making this stuff. In fact, when I was in fourth grade, <coughs> my favorite book was about famous inventors. I just absolutely loved the book about famous inventors. And I'd spend hours and hours and hours tinkering with little bird kites. I have another book called Calling All Minds. It's my childhood kite and parachute projects. We got to get the kids off the devices, get them out doing things. In fact, I just read an article this morning before going to the airport <coughs> that kids that tow walk often have spent too much time on devices. And they need to get out and get more exercise doing things. I was very happy to learn about makerspace that's been started here. We've got to get kids doing things, real things. Today, we're not making it anymore. There's a very, very serious skill loss issue. Half of the large industrial 3D printers are from Europe. This is the state-of-the-art electronic chip-making machine. It's from Holland. Why from Holland? We're paying the price for taking out shop classes and hands-on classes out of schools 20 years ago. We are paying the price for that. And I worked with a lot of really clever people that built equipment for me. They had big shops, patenting stuff. They would definitely be labeled autistic today, or dyslexic, or ADHD. And the problem is, they're not getting retired. 
One of the reasons why the Dutch are making this stuff is when the kids get into ninth grade, you can go a tech track. But, I'll, but then I get concerned about the kids with labels wouldn't get to do that. Because I can tell you right now, kids with labels build this kind of stuff. That's a state-of-the-art pork processing plant. In 2019, I went to two pork processing plants and a poultry processing plant. And all of the equipment was imported from Holland. The poultry plant came over here in 100 shipping containers. That's an issue. That's stuff that we're not making. OK, and then really important parts for the electrical grid is coming from Japan. A parachute, there's the parachute landing on Mars. Like Perseverance likes to take a picture of herself while she's landing on Mars. That fabric's from the UK, woven on high tech European looms. We're not making it. And then I finally went to the Steve Jobs Theater, you know, fairly shortly before COVID shut everything down. And those glass walls are from Italy and Germany. <coughs> There's a lot of state-of-the-art farming equipment right now from Italy. They're very, very mechanical. In fact, we just sold the rights for the book to the Italians. I think they're going to make good use of it. And the carbon fiber roof is from Dubai. And then COVID came along, and I thought, we've got to have something to do. We're going to write about this book, and I'm really aiming a lot of it at business people. And I know a lot of people here tonight are teachers. There's OTs here tonight psychologists. But what I want to impress upon you is there's a connection here between what's going on, autism and things like that, and industry. And it's really, really serious. <coughs> I get asked if I could uh, do one thing to change the schools. I'd be putting all these classes back in. Art, sewing, woodworking. When I was in elementary school, I loved art, sewing, and woodworking. I tried playing musical instruments. That didn't work for me, but I was exposed. <laughs> I worked with people where they had a big shop and they had a single welding class. They got their business started. Theater. I wasn't interested in acting in the play, but I loved making costumes on my toy sewing machine that actually sewed. That's doing things. I put this stuff back in. We're paying the price for taking this out, big time. Another thing <coughs> where we're paying the price, I'm gonna have to get a cough drop here. Sorry, I'm kind of getting over laryngitis. Uh, it was worse yesterday, actually. It's been getting better. It's not as bad as it was yesterday. But um, Another thing that happened 20 years ago is we took these classes out. But then industry shut down in-house engineering departments because it was cheaper to contract the work out. That's coming back to bite them now. Why do I meet plant clients? They'd have big shops. They could build stuff. They've shut that down. Now when equipment needs repairs, they can't find a shop to fix it. And the one shop that's left is ripping them off. Big time. That's what's happening right now. Well, it's screening out my kind of mind that can't do higher math. But I want to make it very clear, you need people like me. I've had a good career. I've really influenced the cattle industry. I've worked on animal welfare uh, audits that really improved how animals were handled. And, you know, real practical, hands-on things. Well, if you're going to do quantum computing, you need linear algebra. Yes, there's things you need higher math for. But there's other things that I call the clever engineering department, where you don't need higher math. You need arithmetic. That you do need. I couldn't do algebra. 60% of community college students need remedial math. Now, does a veterinarian need calculus? I don't think so. I don't know what a veterinarian does with calculus. 
You know, if you're going to be doing orbital mechanics, you need calculus. Yes, there are definitely some fields where you need that. And I've often thought, what would I do if someone waved a magic wand, and I'm now 18 years old, low income, flunked out of high school because I couldn't do algebra, but I still had my knowledge. Oh, I'd head for the Amazon warehouse. I'd head for the new Intel plant they're going to build in Columbus, Ohio. You know what my goal is? I'm going to design the next one. And I have seen people do that in the meat industry. Come in, work in the maintenance department. <coughs> Fifteen years later, project manager for a big new plant expansion. I have seen people do that. That's the back door into jobs. I've seen people do it. And there's a big back door, and most people don't see it. <coughs> but my kind of thinker, yeah, we need some practical math, business math. And I stayed at a really interesting hotel on this book tour called The Graduate. Very interesting hotel, an old historic building. Their ID cards were 1930s student IDs. So I get this room, and this kid's textbooks are in there, except they're from 1930s. So I looked at an electrical engineering book from the 1930s, and it was much more applied. There was a lot of math in there, but each piece of math was paired with a real thing that I could relate to, much more applied. And then I loved the Western literature book, <coughs> there where you study Homer, Shakespeare, all the great writers. I loved the no-nonsense preface. The first sentence was, there's been a lot of nonsense written about the Greeks. Couldn't believe this book. I wish I had more time to read this kid's textbooks because it was much more down to earth and applied. I actually took pictures of some of the, of the electrical engineering book. And then I look at some of the political science books right now. I'm going, I'm sorry. Um, don't understand it. Don't understand it. Now, we got to get back much more in applied things. <coughs> Getting kids out doing things. Field trips. And some schools say, we don't have money for field trips. Well, one day I saw a three-year-old learning all about how water flows because his dad was showing him the drain that came off the roof of our building and how the water would go under this metal plate. So he got the kid, the three-year-old, to take the leaves out of the drain. Then the kid would run over to the other side and watch the water come out. He was having a great time with our roof drain. So it's possible to do these things <coughs> with the most mundane stuff. And the kid was loving it. He was having a great time. Now, I'm not suggesting banning devices. But we got to get three-year-olds out doing a lot more stuff outside. Maker spaces. Good. Yes, and they're going to learn to use tools. <coughs> and when they get older, apprenticeships, internships, kids need to get exposed to enough stuff so they can find out what they're good at. How can you find out you're good at music if you're not exposed to instruments? I was exposed to instruments that didn't work for me. My ability in art was always, always, always encouraged. 20% of the people I worked with could not do algebra. They would definitely be special ed kids if they were young today, owned metal fabrication companies. <coughs> Designing and building complicated equipment, patenting that equipment. And where would those kids be today? We need them to fix things. They're playing video games in the basement on a, on a disability check. And they're not getting fabulous jobs in the, in the video game industry. <coughs> what would happen to some of our top innovators in today's workplace? What would happen to him? What would happen to Michelangelo? 12-year-old kid dropped out of school, running around the churches or doing all kinds of art, so he's exposed. He was also exposed to stone-cutting tools. See, that's exposure. 
I got into the cattle industry because I was exposed to cattle when I was a teenager. That's exposure. And so many kids get into things because they're exposed. I'm always telling students when they go to college, do career relevant internships. Volunteer to work with other professors' experiments. Steve Jobs bullied in school. Tinkered in his neighbor's garage. Einstein, no speech until age three. <coughs> They'd all be special ed kids today. Thomas Edison dropped out of school. He probably had autism. But he learned how to work at an early age. I'm seeing too many kids on the spectrum, too many kids with a label, aren't learning life skills like shopping, saving money, bank account. Just basic, basic life skills. Learning how to work. And I had some great mentors. I had my science teacher who got me motivated to study. When studying became a pathway to a goal, there was a contractor that saw my ability that seeked me out. <coughs> Elon Musk is on the spectrum. I think he's had a pretty good career. Now the thing is, the other reason for keeping all the creative hands-on classes in the schools is a Nobel Prize winner was 50% more likely to have an arts and crafts hobby compared to other scientists. That's another reason for keeping those classes. My grandfather was a co-inventor of the autopilot for airplanes. He was an MIT-trained mathematical engineer. And he worked with another guy who was probably autistic, who came up with this crazy idea for three little coils. coils. They tinkered in a loft and invented the autopilot for airplanes. It was in every warplane during World War II, except the stolen version was every, in every warplane. He should have had a lawyer. This is where he needed a verbal thinker. <laughs> so the thing is, we need all the different kinds of minds. But the first thing we got to figure out is how they bring different skills to the table. Let's look at who builds food processing plants. My kind of mind will do the, <coughs> <coughs> will do the entire plant layout invent highly specialized mechanical equipment. The mathematical minds, boilers, refrigerations, water and power requirements. But where we're losing it is in my kind of mind, the kids that can't do the higher math. So that's why we're getting the equipment from Holland rather, from that, rather than from here. <coughs> we have a huge, gigantic shortage so let's look at this book. This was a big project for us during COVID. I wrote the first drafts. See, visual thinking is associational thinking. It's not linear, it's associational. So I'd write rough drafts that were not very well organized. And Betsy, my co-author, she would reorganize everything. So that's a perfect example of using the two different kinds of minds and understanding the different skills they bring in. But I get worried about verbal thinkers getting too abstract if they don't get out and see stuff. Because I found that to teach Betsy some leverage, getting on third grade science websites didn't work. She only understood it when I said, did you ever use a screwdriver <coughs> to pry open a paint can? <coughs> Then she understood it, when she could relate it back to something real that she had done. Then she understood it. But if people get totally removed from practical things, I'm concerned here. I can't believe that the power company discouraged the installation of solar panels when the power grid's collapsing. I'm going, really? Really, they actually did that? Okay, let's construct nice buildings. We need the artists to make the building <coughs> look nice. Then you need the engineers to make it safe, to make it functional, 
This is where you have the different kinds of minds working together, recognizing their differences. Now, what are some tips for working with minds that are different? <coughs> I have absolutely no working memory. Any task <coughs> that involves sequence, I have to have a pilot's checklist. I have to have a checklist of the steps. Let's say it's something simple like closing out a cash drawer. I've got to have the steps. I cannot remember long strings of verbal information. Simply cannot remember it. Also, we got to you know, stretch these kids, give them some choices, <coughs> pull them out of their comfort zone. But you don't throw them into a situation where they can't function. You don't throw them into sensory overload. That's something that you don't do. That you don't do. Now, sometimes a kid can tolerate a sound better if they turn it on and off. They turn it off on and off the hair dryer or whatever it is that bothers them. <coughs> We've got to limit the devices, the electronic stuff. <coughs> and the other thing that doesn't work is being vague. Where is a student 10 years after graduation? I was doing my first big projects. Good, we got a really good projector here to show off my projects. <laughs> really, really great projector. And the way I sold my work was showing off my portfolio. I learned to sell my work rather than myself. That's where we need to be changing some of the interviewing processes. <coughs> now, a big motivation for me was to prove I wasn't stupid. A lot of people thought I was stupid, and I wasn't going to amount to anything. <coughs> and I wanted to prove I wasn't stupid. That's a drawing right there that I used to <laughs> sell Cargill. I designed the front end of every Cargill plant in North America. That's a drawing I sent to the head of Cargill. Now the thing is, you got to show it to the right person, not the HR department, <laughs> engineering department, plant manager. Somebody is going to appreciate that drawing. And I had a really nice brochure. And that's one of the drawings right there that I sent to the head of Cargill. And that's one of the replicas that was built for the HBO movie. The HBO movie shows exactly how I think. They did a great job. And that's uh, one of the systems I sent to Mr. Fielding. And half the cattle are handled in, a sem in, in equipment I designed. I think that's doing pretty well for somebody they didn't think was mentally retarded. So what I want to do now, <coughs> sorry about all the coughing and stuff, I just can't help it. I'm actually getting better. <laughs> but I want to get you to think differently <coughs> and look at things differently because there's a lot of kids out there. The other problem we got with autism is <coughs> is it such a big spectrum? You're going from Elon Musk to somebody who can't dress themselves, and you put the same name on it. <laughs> that just doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense at all. So I want to get you to think differently about this. Okay, let's get some questions. Okay. Temple, I can tell you this crowd is a very diverse group of thinkers because the questions you're about to get are all over the place okay. and you're going to love this. <laughs> but I'm going to leave tonight thinking about solar and shop and shop for everybody, girls, because I couldn't take shop when it was my age. I, I was. Uh, they did not. 
I was the second girl in fifth grade in my school to be allowed to take shop class. Fantastic. I have a beautiful apron I embroidered, and I am happy I learned how to do that, but shop would have been great. <coughs> okay, here's a couple of questions from our audience here. And you guys poured in with the questions, so we won't get to all of them, giving her voice and everything, but here we go. Do you have very early memories as a child? Like, do you, and, and how early were they? And was it an image that repeated itself? Well, I can have very early in, uh, memories of some speech therapy school when I was three. And there was a lot of emphasis on turn-taking games and learning skills. And my speech teacher, she'd hold up a cup and she'd go cup, and then she'd go cup up. <coughs> And she'd alternate back and forth between saying it fast, the regular way, and saying it very slowly. And I can remember that. And I remember a fun activity we did marching around with flags that I really liked. <laughs> <coughs> and I loved flags when I was a kid. <laughs> all right, here comes the question. We're going to tangent all over the place. Would Japanese language and writing, with its kanji recognition, be in the realm of visual thinking? Well, there's two kinds of visualization. There's picture thinking, photographic thinking. That's the object visualizer. The Japanese writings can be more the pattern thinker, which is the mathematical thinker. You see, there's a mathematical, visual, spatial pattern thinker, and then there's a pictorial thinking in pictures. You see, when I think about the speech therapy class, they're little tiny video clips. There's nothing abstract. And with my kind of thinking, the more data you put in the database, in other words, the more things I go out and see, the better I am at thinking. Because I have more pictures I can pull out of the database. It's like filling Google for images up with pictures. So the more things the kids get out and do, they put more data in the database. And my thinking gets better as I load more data into the database. At the beginning of your book, in the very uh, opening, you, talk, uh, you, you take a quote from Descartes, which says that uh, language is what separates us from the beasts. Well, the thing is, I, what I'm thinking about Descartes, if you think totally verbally, you might have a hard time imagining a dog can think. But to me, it was always ridiculous to say a dog's not conscious. But you see, I don't think in words. Words narrate the pictures. But I got to thinking, <clears throat> if you think just in words, you might have a hard time imagining a dog thinking. Now, Betsy, my highly verbal co-author, got a dog. When she got her first dog, I told her to watch what it does when you turn it loose in a field where it can run around. And then she started to understand <coughs> when she actually watched a dog running around in a field. But she didn't understand it until she got a dog. You see, and that's sort of like prying the lid off the paint can. She didn't understand that. I, I couldn't teach her leverage on little children's websites. But I could only teach her leverage and she pried the lid off a paint can. So, now what worries me <coughs> is we got a lot of politicians and people making policy that have absolutely no practical experience with anything. Then the verbal thinking tends to go into theory. Now there's a place for theory, but I also found in my work I gotta drag those suits out of the office because of my animal welfare work. <coughs> the thing that motivated corporate level vice presidents at McDonald's and other companies to do something about welfare is when they actually got out in the field and saw something bad. And then it was like that show Undercover Boss. <laughs> no, we gotta do something. It was no longer abstract. It was no longer a spreadsheet. <coughs> Give it to PR, give it to lawyers. It was now something real. But they didn't see it <coughs> until they actually went out in the field. So 
So do you feel, I, I, I know you're not verbal thinking shaming here for those of us out there in the audience who are verbal thinkers and we want to be more visual thinkers. We're looking at your book. Is it, is it possible? You said that you can't be both at once. Well, there are some people, lots of people are mixtures. Yes. They're mixtures. But one type usually predominates. The mathematics or, or, the, or the verbal, one of them tends to be kind of dominant. And sometimes you take someone like that speech therapist that just saw the pointy thing like this. Sometimes I might be able to force her to see her neighborhood church. But she'd have to be really forced. <coughs> now, you're not going to take somebody like me and make me a mathematician. That's not going to happen. <laughs> We're glad. <laughs> but... The thing I want to get across is you need my kind of mind. Yep, right now I'm seeing that 59 cent bracket from 1921 that dropped the wire down and caused that fire. Hmm. See, there's nothing abstract about it. Nothing that. Do you feel there is something about gender, the gender equation about how we think, whether we are in one of those categories? Well, there's a lot of variation and, and I, I don't know, but we'll leave that for somebody else to figure out. Okay. <laughs> but, <coughs> I'm okay. an extreme object visualizer, and the people I worked with on machinery design and that built equipment for me were object visualizers that couldn't do algebra. But the thing that was interesting is my kind of mind, we never messed with boilers and refrigeration. We didn't understand that stuff. That's for the more mathematical kind of engineering. And I saw that division of engineering labor. Every factory I worked with, I worked with every major meat company spending weeks out on construction sites. You're getting a <coughs> lot of love in the audience uh, about the autism community, just gratitude for who you are and for speaking so openly about it. If somebody is in this audience or has a child who's trying to get a job who's autistic, do you have any suggestions for making it through the job interview from just I'd getting- I'd like to short circuit a lot of the job interview stuff. Half of all good jobs are through the back door. Through just, <laughs> <laughs> you know somebody that has a shop? Yeah. Have lots of good jobs. See, my mind thinks in specific examples. And when I visited Apple, I talked to a young man who was from the Midwest had a job at Apple working on hardware. I said, how'd you get that job? His professor knew somebody at Apple. Yeah. Okay, that is an example of just contacts. And these doors are everywhere and people don't see them. And there's a scene in the HBO movie where I walk up to the editor of the magazine and I get his card. Because I knew if I wrote for that fire magazine that would help my career. I saw that door, I walked up and I got the card I produced the article. These back doors are everywhere, and people are just not seeing them because they're too locked into the label. Now, in talking to big corporations, I find some big corporations are really amenable to changing their interviewing process, and others go, oh, we can't change it. No, but it's something we're going to need to change because your very best mechanic <coughs> doesn't interview well. Now, I know one guy, this particular guy wasn't autistic, but he took a one-semester class in community college on computer-aided drafting. He took one of his homework assignments into the engineering department of one of the big meat plants and was hired. And he's laying out entire factories. And unfortunately, those companies now have shut down these engineering departments. You know, like right now, state-of-the-art machine tools, they come from Japan. See, people don't realize that you need my kind of mind to build equipment to do a lot of things. <coughs> we know that you like to improve things, so somebody in the audience, I'd love to know who you are, wants to know if you have an idea of how to improve airport security so that we could just travel with greater ease. 
Well, a person with autism would be super good at running the x-ray machine because they'd find all the stuff that's not supposed to be there. <laughs> and the other thing, no, I'm serious. And the other thing is they wouldn't get bored. So the other problem with those kind of jobs is they get boring. <laughs> it's true. Well, the, the biggest problem with, with a lot of these things is understaffing. Everything is understaffed. Restaurants, everything. Yeah. And, and a lot of the problems with the airport tie-ups, it's understaffing. Yeah. And it's a big problem. And it's, not, it's just everywhere. <coughs> I don't know, there's, we've, I've had a lot of discussions with people about COVID, uh, cutting back uh, work motivation and things like that. No, I think kids need to be taught how to work. You see, academic skills and work skills are not the same skills. And I cannot emphasize that enough. And we need to be teaching work skills. Let's talk about my work skills. Chores when you're young. And when kids get to be around 11 years old, how about volunteer jobs on a schedule where somebody outside the home is a boss? Somebody else has to be the boss. Instant or legal, real jobs. When they're in college, internships, career relevant stuff. And I'm seeing too many autistic kids that do well academically and lose it in the workplace because they haven't learned work skills. <coughs> and they're not the same as academic skills. I agree with you, too, that we need to also not be prejudiced against people who choose those. I'll tell you, I had a son who didn't go to university, and everybody would ask what he's doing. Well, the I'd one say, place where you don't need to go to the university and you can end up with a corporate jet, yeah. I'm serious, is high-end skilled trades. Yeah. There's a um, guy who makes specialized tools for the meat industry. He has a corporate jet. I've been on it. There's another one, single welding class. He's doing major big construction. He has a corporate jet. So <coughs> the real high-end skilled trades is the one place you don't need a university education. A lot of other stuff you do. Yeah. And that's the reason why Holland is making the meat packing and plant equipment, and they're also making the electronic chip making machine. Yeah, but both ways. Have, this is a question about um, <coughs> your own autism and asking if you have self-soothing methods that have changed over the years as you age. Well, one thing I find I have to do is I do 100 sit-ups every night, which I despise. <laughs> and that burst of hard exercise helps to calm me down. I had my squeezing machine, which is described in my book, Thinking in Pictures. That helped to calm me down. Another thing that would help when I had really bad anxiety was like late in the afternoon, I'd go watch Star Trek. <laughs> but i am also been on antidepressant medication for 40 years, and it was for anxiety. And that's not in this book, but it's in my book, Thinking in Pictures. Now, there's been a lot of press lately. The antidepressants don't work. I just read a big article in The Economist. But that's for depression. I take them for anxiety. They do work for anxiety. And the big mistake that's made is too high a dose. And even though thinking in pictures is 25 years old, it's still accurate. And I just did a new afterward, and then I went through all the literature again. But the squeezing machine helped calm me down. And I know people that are autistic uh, working in industry. They had to have some time off in the afternoon to just go sit in a chair and kind of chill out. So there's uh, some people on the spectrum, they had a quiet place to work. They're going to have problems with LED lights that flicker. The way you can find out if LED lights flicker is take some pictures with a slow motion video and wave like this so when you play it back, you know it's in slow motion. And the bad LED lights will flicker. Um, you know, and those are fairly simple accommodations. Now, the people I worked with that were really successful, they had their own businesses. <coughs> and they ranged from little shops to big shops. But you see, the way you get in, the way these shops would start, is they'd do some work for a plant, some little repair job. They'd like them. 
and then have them do a bigger job. And then 20 years later, they're building entire plants. I've seen that. And these people had barely graduated from high school. It's the one place you don't need a college education is high-end skilled trades. I'm not talking about floor tiles here. I'm talking about the real <laughs> high-end stuff. And these people are patenting and inventing equipment. But then right now, to repair some of the stuff I've designed, the one shop that's left is ripping everybody off. Because the problem is the little shops are not forming. See, this is where there's a connection with education. That kid's in the basement playing video games. Never used a tool in his life. There's a connection here. There's a connection. And I don't know how you got managed to get an electric company that convinced people here the collapsing power grid to not put solar panels on houses. I, I, to me, that's like, like, <laughs> really? Who's, who's got the most wind power and the most solar panels? Texas. <laughs> I'm serious. Been there, seen them. <laughs> no, no, I didn't read about them, see them. Airplane final approach. Get out, visit some feedlots, tons of windmills out there. You're making me want to leave right now and wake up and call the solar. Well, company. you also have to have people to maintain <laughs> them. Because we got one bunch of wind fills in Colorado that's 20 years old. And I was just looking at the paper and the top fell off of one of them. Yeah. Because they never, no one maintained it. You see, and that's something that can be a career. You got to maintain this stuff. You got investors coming in here, building big fields full of solar panels. Who's going to maintain them? I think they belong on roofs of houses. They got a better chance of getting maintained. That's true. It's one thing to get it going, yeah, but the technology. It's also something where it's a much more local sustainability effort, which I think in the future a lot of very successful things will be a lot more local. Agreed. Here's a question Do you like animals better than humans? And do you consider humans animals? Well, let's, um, well, biologically, the nervous system, body plan, genetics, um, a lot of that's 90% the same. See, like the thing called the Hox genes, there's a body layout, two eyes, two nostrils, four limbs. That's the same in all mammals. Now, when you look at the brain, the emotion circuits are pretty much the same. The thing that's different is we got a gigantic computer sitting up here on top that animals don't have. That's the main difference. Huge computing power up here. <coughs> so people have language and animals don't. And which do you prefer? Well, I like both, actually. <laughs> OK. So before we let you leave tonight, um, and we, you've left us with much to think about and a mandate to go get solar on your roof. If you didn't get that tonight, knew that. Well, I just can't believe that. He had a power company telling people not to put solar in when the so, wires are falling so, down. Okay. You see, that's something that I see. And we need to get those suits out of the office and they need to get out in the field and look at stuff. You know, you look at problems with power plants and stuff like that. You know how to find out problems with power plants? You just got to go find the maintenance shop. And then you got to show them your non-suit cred. And they will tell you everything. Everything. <laughs> But you have, to be, you have to protect them so they don't get fired. <laughs> so as soon as the suit walks in, they won't talk. Well, you, I can tell you, I go in a power plant, I'll get down to that maintenance shop. I'll find out what's <laughs> wrong with it really quickly. OK, so we're going to, the, these are the two last questions. OK. It is, is there something that you would have wanted to be in life that you haven't been able to manifest? Oh, I wanted to do aerospace engineering. Okay. And I had to drop the engineering classes. Couldn't do the math. Oh. No, nope, no, nope, that's what I wanted to do. Couldn't do it. Had to drop a physics class. Me and Bill Gates were exposed to the exact same IBM computer. He could do it, I couldn't. I had to drop the programming class. So I had to get into a field. I majored in psychology with less math requirements. 
never have passed an algebra class, but I'm really concerned that you're screening me out. You need us. You need us uh, people that suck at math. And you need us very, very much. Okay. And here's the last question, last question. Uh, I was raised, my father was in the dairy industry, and somebody out here in the audience asked, what is your favorite kind of cow? Well, I like beef cattle. I grew up in Arizona. My beef industry stuff started in Arizona, so I everything was Hereford cattle back in the 70s. You know, and it's Angus cattle now, but back in the 70s, it's all Herefords. I kind of really like them, because that's what I started with. Because yeah. everything was Hereford cattle in the 70s. And I'm sorry about all the coughing and stuff like that. Hey. But I hope I kind of give it, yeah. <laughs> A different way of looking at things. Temple, you totally inspire us. We're going out into the night with your book, and we're going to... Well, I'll world. personalize a few books if people want to do that. Okay. I got okay. some pens in my pocket. Okay. Okay. Everybody, thank you for being here. Thank you, Temple. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. <laughs>